Welcome to the first service at Morgan Mill Baptist. We're continuing where we were last week in the Sermon on the Mount. We're looking at Matthew, the fifth chapter, there in verse 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Abolish there, the Greek root is kataluo. The Lord did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We saw last week that the Greek root for fulfill is plerao, and the Lord indeed did fulfill it. As we saw last week, humans cannot fulfill the law. Works of the flesh can never achieve salvation, nor ever would be able to enter in the presence of God. We must do so by faith receiving the grace of God through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God's law is good. It points out our need for salvation. It points out our failure in working in the flesh to achieve righteousness. But it also points to the grace of God. No one is saved by works. All are saved by grace. We saw last week in uh, Abraham in Romans chapter 4, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham was saved by faith, not works. Then we also saw examples of Noah found favor, grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Enoch, those from Genesis. We also saw last week, that salvation was never by works in the Old Testament. All who were saved by, were saved by faith. We covered that both with Old Testament passages and in New Testament passages. We contrasted in Matthew the 19th chapter the rich young ruler wanting to come to God by works and trying to find a loophole. He, he couldn't get there by works and the Lord was reminding him he could not get there by works. But in Matthew, the 19th chapter, the Lord also refers to the children being brought to him. And some were saying, no, no, keep the children away from the Lord. The Lord said, no, let them come unto me. And he said of them, of, they're in verse 14 in Matthew, the 19th chapter, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So, so those who come to God come with childlike faith, not by works of the flesh. Uh, we see that God's law and God's grace are good. The law tells us what is righteousness and what is sin, but we fail at both, as we saw in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The moral law points out our need for salvation, and we must call upon Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior by faith and receive the grace of God, the free gift, Romans 6.23. How does God do this? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The moral and ceremonial law we looked at last week, the moral law, right and wrong, is the same. Out of the Old Covenant, Leviticus, under the New Covenant, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the moral law is repeated, both Old and New Covenant. Uh, they're from 1 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 9 and following. That which is a moral sin in Leviticus is also a moral sin in the New Testament and all the other uh, books of the Old Testament versus all the books of the New Testament. The moral law does not change from Old to New Covenant. The ceremonial law, however, uh, the Sabbath command is not repeated in the New Covenant. We covered that. The dietary laws and other aspects of the ceremonial law are not repeated. The ceremonial law was designed to separate the children of Israel from unbelievers and set them apart to God. In the New Covenant, that is done internally, not externally, but internally. Uh, the words of Christ will richly dwell within us, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and we will be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And these we saw last week were all promised in Jeremiah the 31st chapter. The New Covenant would come in and God would write the words on our hearts. Again, the internal emphasized over the external. But the question comes also from these next two verses. That's what we want to cover this week. Of the next two verses, what is life under grace as opposed to life under the law? How does this deal with both the judgment 
or the assessment to come, whether one is outside of Christ or one is in Christ, and those gates, either coming to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the narrow gate, or rejecting him and walking the way of the world, the wide gate, how do those lead both to life in Christ for those who come to Christ, uh, but also the end of judgment or an eternal life with Christ in God's grace, mercy, and love. And we'll see that in part two.